Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda White TG, and I'm the managing director at Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis. Um, we are on a very strict time constraint today, and um, as a result, because we've been asked to construct this specifically, I am abandoning theatricality and sticking to a script for you. Um, I have a lot of material to get through, so I'll talk for close to 20 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, also, uh, you've probably heard this in your first session, but AMS has asked you to evaluate um, when we're done what construct, what model you think um, radical hospitality falls under, and we'll report it to the very wonderful JP in the back, um, who is our timekeeper extraordinaire, um, and he'll report back. Um, I'm going to jump right in. The question that I am addressing today for you is, what is one way in which a theater company erases the cost barrier for its audiences and retains a sustainable business model? Mixed Blood was founded by a very young Jack Ruler in 1976 with the primary objective of attracting a non-traditional audience. Um, so Jack tells me that at the time he knew what a traditional audience looked like and it did not in any way resemble the world outside the firehouse doors. Um, that commitment to outreach is still central to our work at the theater today and it continues to shape access and en audience engagement efforts in every form at the theater. So I am here to tell you about the company's most recent outreach initiative, Radical Hospitality, the no-cost admission effort that is changing the way we do business at Mixed Blood. We have a lot of passionate conversations as a staff about how best to word this. Um, that word free can be uh, very charged, um, but I'm up here by myself, so I'm going to tell you in my own words. Uh, Radical Hospitality, in a nutshell, started as a program that allowed Mixed Blood to give away half of its tickets to every performance at no cost. So a lot of what I'll talk about today, we've talked about already, um, and I'm really delighted to say that you'll hear some themes coming up from our conversations from earlier today. I think it's really important to be clear right now about what I consider to be the first takeaway from our work on radical hospitality, which is that the initiative came out of a, over a decade of research and strategic planning around creating greater access to live theater in the Twin Cities. So that marathon uh, versus, uh, the marathon versus sprint notion is really present here. Um, and this idea of removing barriers to access, um, those false barriers in society, is really at the heart of Mixed Blood's work. So to give you some background, in 1999 to 2000, in that season, five strategic and staff-driven commitments were put to paper informally, but they became the predecessors to Mixed Blood's first strategic plan. The first was to identify and find target audiences based on the content and characters of each of the season's individual plays. With an assumption that the who, that who attends the theater is, as le is at least as important as how many people attend, Mixed Blood went out in search of a specific audience for every specific production. That audience to which a play m might most mightily speak and the audience for and by whom that play was created. You may have just heard Woolly Mammoth talk about their incredible connectivity program that's rooted in that same concept. Um, this targeted marketing effort replaced a traditional marketing effort of just finding a general audience for the show, traditional theater goers, and then working hard to get them to return again and again. Since the shift in marketing effort, audience diversity has continued to grow, and our capacity has increased, but repeat attendance has been minimal. So this is one of the things that we're trying to learn at Mixed Blood about radical hospitality. Um, in a time when cost is not an issue, what incentivizes loyalty? Uh, next, a dedicated effort to finding audiences for culturally specific programming would be anchored by the creation of an ethno metro pass, a subscription that included all of Mixed Blood's main stage shows, and then in addition, four to five culturally specific productions that were produced by either culturally specific theaters or historically white institutions. And the ethno metro pass is actually still in existence today, but where it was initially designed to be an extension of Mixed Blood's marketing efforts, it is now designed to find an audience for culturally specific work in the Twin Cities. The staff made the decision that seeking audiences from the worlds of disability would become a manifestation of the organization's mission, incorporated in program choices, in marketing efforts, and in our audience services. 
The Twin Cities Latino population was also growing significantly in the 1990s as it continues to do, and more and more Latino immigrants were calling Minnesota home. So it was decided that plays by American Latinos that would, were already be long produced by mixed blood um, and intended for Latino audiences would be performed in Spanish and English by bilingual casts. This gets at another takeaway for radical hospitality. Authenticity, as we learned today, is ultimately important in these outreach efforts. Mixed Blood asked this growing community specifically the question, what is keeping you from attending? And the answer was, in part, a language barrier. Eliminating that barrier then became a priority for Mixed Blood. And finally, season passes, allowing maximum flexibility, would be offer offered as a modified sort of set subscription model. In addition, the Ethno Metro Pass would continue to offer culturally specific theater to Mixed Blood's pass holders. In pursuit of these five strategic commitments, Mixed Blood built a foundation uh, of access efforts that would continue across the next decade. And then along came a game changer in 2008. In 2008, Minnesotans voted for the Legacy Amendment, which allowed an increase in state sales tax, with a dedicated percentage going straight to the arts and to funding in the state. The state began co collecting that tax in 2009. Mixed Blood has been the very grateful recipient of two grants that were um, of legacy funding. So in 2009, with the funding to support this research, Mixed Blood staff and board conducted strategic planning, revisiting mission, vision, and core values, and establishing our strategic priorities. So connecting four things, mission, a vision that includes revolutionizing access to live theater, a core value of being an egalitarian organization, and a strategic goal of developing new methods to attract and retain targeted populations in the audience, the company went in pursuit of a direct answer to the question, what then are the barriers for access to live theater for all of the Twin Cities? That year, Mixed Blood hired a disability liaison and a Latino liaison. The establishment of a Latino advisory council began. Focus groups with leaders of disability organizations were conducted, and bathrooms, transportation, and front of house demeanor were identified as further barriers for people with disabilities. Language translation was again identified as a barrier for the monolingual Spanish speaker, and both groups identified cost and cultural content as barriers to participation. So in 2010, at the recommendation of Artistic Director Jack Ruler, Mixed Blood's board got right to the heart of the matter and explored the idea that if cost is a barrier, perhaps we should bring in free theater. They brought in MBA students, IT specialists, and other consultants, and ultimately, the board of directors unanimously endorsed the launch of what would become known as Radical Hospitality. The next season brought a $191,000 Minnesota State Arts, Arts Board grant supported by legacy funds to explore, roll out, subsidize, and analyze Radical Hospitality. Eight months of development, including research into TCG's Free Night of Theater, the Signature Theater's Ticket Initiative, and the public's Shakespeare in the Park led to Radical Hospitality's launch. We opened the doors in September of 2011 to a line of people waiting outside the theater queued up for Radical Hospitality admission. So it works like this. Two hours prior to showtime, the box office releases Radical Hospitality admission to anyone who walks up and requests a ticket in person. Mixed Blood is committed to reserving a significant percentage of the house for no cost admission, and as a rule, we try to keep it at around 50% of the seats. If someone wants to guarantee their admission and not risk trying for a walk-up seat, they can reserve their seats ahead of time for a $20 fee. And you can do that online or with the box office. Starting two hours prior to showtime, when Radical Hospitality admissions are opened, it is no longer possible to purchase seats. So anyone who approaches the box office and asks for a ticket, is asked to make a donation if they're uncomfortable with complimentary admission. And you would be surprised at how often that happens. In addition to offering no-cost seats to our guests, Mixed Blood's Disability Advisory Council advised that another major barrier to access for our guests with disabilities is transportation. So as a result, Mixed Blood entered into a partnership with Red and White Cab of the Twin Cities to offer free round-trip cab fare to and from the theater. Um, for anyone self-identifying as a person with a disability. It's now a very well-funded program, but interestingly, its successful marketing and promotion remains one of our challenges. So in season one, last season, what we found out was that weekly attendance was 20% over FYO9, 
18% over FY10 and 8% over FY11. Individual gifts, and this to me is a huge takeaway, this little bullet right here. Individual gifts increased by three times. The average gift from our donors fell from $150 as an average gift to a $100 gift. Um, but the donor base, the gifts themselves increased three times. Um, in contrast to that, however, 30% of our season pass holders fell off, are lapsed. And in addition, in this season, we've seen another lapse. So a huge point of learning for us through radical hospitality in this model is what then, as I said before, incentivizes loyalty if cost is not an issue. If you have ideas, I invite you to share them at the microphone when we open up for Q&A. Um, uh, but I'll talk a little bit in a while about some of uh, the things we've sort of structured in considering a new pass holder model. Um, as you can see here, of our radical hospitality users, which as I said before, is about half of our house for every performance. 47% of them in FY12 were under the age of 30, 33% had annual household incomes of under $25,000 a year, and 30% of them were people of color. In an effort to diversify our audiences so that they do reflect more the world outside the theater doors, radical hospitality, I'm here to report to you, is a success. Uh, we have a great a deal of things to learn, but that part of it, the heart of the effort works. This season we've seen an uh, increasing diversification in our audiences. Now 60% of those users are 30 or younger and 37% of them have annual household incomes of $25,000 a year or less. We've stayed the same people of color in attendance at about 30% who are radical hospitality users. I should be clear in saying that we've had one show in the season so far this year. So this information at the end of our season will be, uh, I feel, a little more complete. Um, but so far, this is what we know about our radical hospitality users this season. So how do we keep it radical? We've had a lot of conversation in the theater about um, radical hospitality being a successful business model and being something that seems like just good business uh, to be hospitable to our guests. Um, ticket sales at Mixed Blood make up about 18 to 20 percent of our budget. So really it's a 180,000 to about $200,000 nut to crack each year. Um, knowing that, it's not a significant financial risk that we take as an institution. Um, it happens to be something that, that makes sense for us and not something that will close our doors um, if there's failure. So then why is it radical? How is it radical? While we may have been under the impression initially that Radical Hospitality was a free ticket program, we have since been entirely freed of our delusions. So here's another takeaway alert for you. The genuine pursuit, as you can see in bullet one, of revolutionizing access is entirely systemic. It requires an entire reconstruction of our business model. We eliminated our director of development and our director of marketing positions and exchanged them for a community outreach team that works from start to finish with our guests who come through the door. Um, they have, perhaps counterintuitively, rejected some traditional uh, marketing efforts in pursuit of grassroots marketing. So they go out into the community and go to churches, schools, community centers, and invite people to attend shows that may specifically speak to them. Um, Over the first season of Radical Hospitality, our audience also taught us that their preferred method of contact with the theater may not also be in direct contact with our programming and our staff in our space. This is not always easy information to swallow for artists. Um, Interproducer in residence, Jamil Jude, and Mixed Blood's free speech program, which is designed to give the audience access to Mixed Blood way beyond and outside of showtime. Free speech allows audience members to share their opinions, their questions, their insights, their accusations, and their suggestions publicly via Twitter, Facebook, on the Mixed Blood blog, and even on our lobby walls. Um, some of you have already talked with us about this today, but we have huge pieces of butcher block paper that go on our lobby walls, and people are invited to walk up and write down their thoughts about the show, or about Mixed Blood, or about the thematic content in a piece, and to share them um, with other audience members, either before and after the show or at intermission. 
Jamil and the staff also conduct post-show forums after every performance, and a mixed blood senior staffer live tweets those conversations to loop in anyone participating outside the theater. For mixed blood, social media has become an access issue. We have guests who have disabilities that don't allow for their participation in the space. They have social anxieties or discomforts with crowds. So we invite them to participate in the shows um, via social media. In fact, last year, we even had the great honor of live streaming one of our productions on the spectrum that was about two young people on the autism spectrum and invited our audience members to participate from their living rooms. Um, we broadcast it through via New Play TV, and uh, over a thousand people tuned into the live stream and were able to comment in real time as the show was happening. Um, we had some tremendous response from it, and it was for me totally moving to hear someone say, "This is the first time we've ever been able to participate as a family in a piece of live theater." Um, so that felt like a great success. We host at least one Twitter seat night tw tweet seats, we call them, during every run of a production. We started our first tweet seats last season in our first show, and it was me, Jamil, and a friend of our artistic directors who felt sorry for us. And the three of us tweeted and you know, said, OK, what is this? Let's see what tweet seats are about. Now, I'm happy to report to you that during the, la the run of our last show, Next to Normal, uh, the entire back row of the theater was filled with live tweeters, and we had to crack open a few seats below. I'm hoping the program continues to grow. And as uh, we all know, tweet seats is a totally volatile topic of conversation right now, so I hope this will come up in our, in our Q&A. We can talk some more about it. We also follow every Sunday matinee with what we, something we call a Sunday salon, which is uh, a curated series of panelists who um, are experts from the community um, or experts in a particular subject area who sit together and address certain issues that are relevant to the production content. Community members and audience members are invited. You don't have to have seen the show to attend a salon, um, but they happen every Sunday and also give another opportunity for our audiences to engage with the content. Um, sorry, y'all. What we've learned is by meeting audience members and guests where they are outside of their comfort zone, outside of convention, even sometimes outside of reason, is really the solution here. We have learned that our audience members, if in fact we are agreeing to crack open our doors and invite our audiences in to experience live theater who are non-traditional theater goers, then we can either shame them into adhering to a standard theater etiquette by turning off their phones, by not yelling at the actors, and by staying at their seats during the performance. Or we can meet them where they are, and we can say, we have cracked open our doors, we have invited you into this space, so now we, uh, we volunteer to learn from you about how you want to experience a piece of theater. If we're committed to saying, we would like you to see a piece of theater written in your own voice and spoken in your own voice about your own community, then we can uh, not as an organization commit to then uh, in enforcing a different kind of etiquette. So we're learning a lot about that as well. We're also learning that um, we can expand our funder base, that we can develop non-traditional relationships with funders and with organizations that are interested in promoting the idea that theater making is a vehicle for civic partnership and a quality of life indicator. Um, recently, Allianz uh, sent some funding for our transportation fund and agreed with us that uh, right next to food and shelter, Creative expression is a quality of life indicator, which uh, to our organization was significant. So thinking about how we are a social service organization in addition to a theater company um, makes for some sort of expanded thinking about funding opportunities. We have asked our guests who are able to consider themselves stakeholders in a process. We've asked them to pay it forward when they are able in support of this kind of work, and we really feel strongly that in the long run, that in this marathon game, radical hospitality will be a successful model for us in revolutionizing access to live theater in the Twin Cities. Um, so I invite you to ask any questions that you have about our model. Anything I can tell you, I'm happy to. Yeah, I think we have to use the microphones, I'm sorry to say. It's the awkward walk to the mic every time. 
Um, thank you for that. Um, sure. I'm interested in your in your free seats that you ask people for donations. Uh, my name is John White Spanner from Bloomsburg Theatre Ensemble. Um, is there an average that you get back on that? Because um, we're doing a whole, we're doing something we've never done before, 10 performances of the next play we're doing. Um, yeah, they're all pay what you want. And it's a huge experiment and I'm you're kind of using our own numbers, but I'm just interested in what you're... Yep, um, uh, it's a pretty wild range. I would say the biggest gift I've seen somebody just hand to us in the lobby is probably $200. Um, uh, we break it down for people and say, if you give this donation, this many people are served. So it's, uh, I think, a, a person uh, analogy that people are really comfortable with. They like that idea. The other thing that a development director might be a little uncomfortable with, but I'm here to tell you I am thrilled about, is that sometimes we get uh, an envelope at when we're, count, when we're going through donation envelopes later, that will have like $2.37 and a gum wrapper in it. Um, to me, it looks like just somebody sh reached in their pocket and put something in an envelope, which indicates just immense community buy-in. That's very exciting to me. Um, but like I said, it's kind of all over the, the spectrum, and we really try to uh, make it a transaction-free space in the lobby so we don't carefully monitor those donations until you know, we're in our administrative offices. So, uh, but yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty wide range. But I would say, by and large, people are very willing to support this idea of um, you know, supporting other people who aren't able to pay. So just bringing somebody along, if you will. It seems to work well. Yeah. I'm Brad Erickson from Theater Bay Area, and Hi. actually there's a really long tradition in the, in the Bay Area, especially among the smaller theaters, to have sliding scale. So it's not free, but like anywhere between 10 to 50, I mean literally it goes up that high. Mm -hmm. and, and there's kind of sometimes like a, a weird guilt thing of like, well, you don't want to pay the lowest, and you don't want to pay the highest. So I'm just, if I want to make sure that I'm hearing what you're saying is that, 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 that it's not a transaction that's happening at the box office. You're actually getting a ticket or whatever the thing is for free, and then once you're inside the lobby, you're getting some sort of communication about, we would love it if you would contribute something, but there's not a kind of, in the, you know, with, the, with the someone at the box office who's sort of like, no, giving you not. some sort of you know, signal that really we would appreciate it if you slipped something through the uh, turnstile here. No. <laughs> Great, and, okay. And, and to be really clear too about that, um, what we do is, we don't, we, there's no transaction at the box office at all. You come up and, and, but you'd be surprised at how many people say, I'm able to pay for a ticket. And at the box office, two hours prior to the show, as I said, we cut off financial transactions. So even if you want to buy a ticket, you are not allowed to do that. We do that because, so we eliminate that kind of peer pressure. Well, the person in front of me bought a ticket, so maybe I should. Or, um, so what we do is, if someone says, I really would like to buy my ticket, we say, well, feel free to make a donation. The donation envelopes are over there. Um, and then we send a follow-up letter to every single person who attends the show, regardless of if they used radical hospitality or not. And we say, thank you so much for attending. It was a total delight to have you in the space. Here's a little bit about sort of what we're experiencing as we move through this production in the firehouse. Um, and also, if you want to give, we invite you to do it. Here's how you do it. If you don't want to, we, we beg you to just take us at our word. The tickets are free always. Keep coming back again and again and bring people with you. So it's a very soft sell. Um, but the bottom line is, sometimes allowing for this you know, totally open access, it's not always pretty or easy. I mean, when, people who come into our space are not just, oh gosh, I'm a college student and I can afford a $10 ticket but not a $20. Often it's people who are homeless, who wander in off the street, people who are profoundly mentally ill, who are looking for a quiet place to sit in the dark for a while. I mean, we have a wide range of people who attend the space. And for the staff, a huge point of learning has been, if we are indeed being radically hospitable, then how do we very lovingly welcome these people into our space and also allow for the fact that some other audience members may be a little uncomfortable? What we found the solution to be is to to just address it directly. Uh, Joyce, we would like you to meet Steve, who is you know, here from 
such and such a place. Uh, Steve is, you know, we introduce people to each other who are sitting next to each other, or we find ways to say, thank you for taking care of each other in this space. You are sitting next to a wildly diverse group of people. Um, you know, so sometimes there are some issues that come up where we um, have to ask our audience members to take huge steps with us in just being embracing of their entire community. So it's a pretty wide range of attendees. <laughs> At the uh, point of giving away the free tickets, are you collecting demographic information, contact information? Because you said that you then contact all of your audience members no matter how they came to you. Yeah, we and do. And how is that collecting contact information <laughs> at the point of handing a free ticket? OK, so we've done something wild with this. Um, we, uh, we do collect contact information in exchange for the ticket. That's the exchange. Um, we, it, that is also not a hard sell. We don't absolutely insist on it from people. We're, Mixed Blood is on a block that has 4,000 residents. It's uh, in these residential towers on the same block are people who are from 60 plus countries and speak 90 plus languages and have all kinds of you know, cultural information they're coming into the space with and sometimes they just don't want you to know who they are. Um, so we don't insist on it. But people are actually really terrific about giving us the contact information and we get a significant bulk of that. Um, the, we do have this pretty, this new survey process that I have to tell you about. It is work intensive, but boy, does it ever work. Um, last year, so for every, Mixed Blood is kind of famous for its surveying. We are like exhaustive surveyors. Uh, and our audience members always kind of make a joke about it, like, oh, great, I picked survey night again, or you know, whatever. Um, but also, we have the same problems that you have, probably, in that you know you find a bulk of them on the floor when people leave, or they shove them in their pockets, or whatever. So we survey between like six to nine performances of every production. So we last year, I bought 200 clipboards. <laughs> we have a house of 200, and we put the survey, the playbill, and a pencil on a clipboard. And we stack these before the show every night. And then as people come in, the usher gives a little elevator speech. Here's why we are surveying you. This is wh what your demographic data will support in our work. Um, and then they go in. And then the staff, two to three of us every night, wanders through the house, sitting with people, talking with them. Sometimes we just say, you know, peer pressure alert, and we just stand and wait for their survey to be finished. Um, and we collect them and put them into boxes. Sometimes there are people, uh, we have a, a lot of people who come to the show who do have issues. Um, they're unable to complete a survey on their own, so the staff will sit with them and help them complete it. Um, and we get a 90% return rate on our surveys. So it works. It's totally peer pressure based. <laughs> we can see your clipboard. You're not getting out of the theater with it. Um, and we just sit with people and just ask. So we have we can rely on that demographic data. Um, and I, my fear about it was people would just, you know, it's, it's kind of work intensive and people would be annoyed by it. And they have been so gracious for the most part. I mean, every once in a while you get the outlier who's super annoyed, but we also don't insist that you take the survey either, so. Is anybody else doing tweet seeds? Oh. Uh huh. Um, you know, I have to be really honest in saying that at first, I wasn't really sure. At first, the feedback we were getting from people was sometimes I don't like to be in the space. And so I thought, well, okay, for a few people, maybe this will be a thing, you know, that will allow them some access to our work. So, like I said, it started off kind of small. Um, what happened remarkably is that people taught us how it works. They came into the theater and sat down and we assigned a senior staffer to serve as a moderator for every tweet seat night. So the, mo the moderator was prepared with content about the production's themes that he or she had discussed with the artistic or production staff uh, and armed with sort of pop-up trivia information that could be dispensed throughout the performance to give sort of fodder for conversation. Um, but in the audience doesn't really need to be led. I mean, generally speaking, our tweet seeders 
will start in instantly with, oh my gosh, I hadn't actually thought about that related to, you know, being a member of the Muslim community, or, you know, they jump right in with deep content. We give them at the box office a one sheet that says, here are the rules for tweeting at Mixed Blood. Just gives them some best practices. I'm happy to send that to any of you if you'd like to see it. Um, essentially, it just says, here, is, here are the best kind of things to tweet about. Please don't make fun of our actors while they're on stage. You know, please don't use it as a time to chat with your BFF about something unrelated. Um, we make sure that they have our Twitter handle and our hashtag information and that they're introduced to each other so that they um, become tweet seat, the, or tweet seat, they become Twitter friends or follow each other. So they're all kind of in communication throughout the course of the evening as well. Um, we also do really project to our audience, this is happening. We're asking you to participate in an access issue, an access effort. We make signs for the lobby and the box office tells every audience member coming through, just FYI, tonight are tweet seats. You will not see any ambient light. We've asked the tweeters to turn down their phones and to put their phones on silent. Um, they will be sitting in the back, um, but they're there, and they're, in, they're working to support a group of people interested in the production outside of the building, which is exciting. So you're part of something. Please participate and be gracious with these people, and people are wildly energetic about it and excited about what we're doing. If they don't understand Twitter, they still think it's fun for the most part. Sometimes people are, you know, a little curmudgeonly about it and we just make sure they're sitting far enough up that they're not affected by it at all. Um, but we also have, I do an orientation with every artist that comes into the space on the first day of rehearsal and explain to them, this is what we're about now. We have this kind of expanded access effort at Mixed Blood. So you will see people in the audience tweeting. They will follow you. They will ask you questions. Um, they will try to engage with you. If you're comfortable with it, please engage back. We get their social media information and share it if they're comfortable. Um, and this happened last season. It was magical. Um, in the audience, some of the tweeters were working together to figure out um, something that was happening on stage. And one of the actors backstage who was following the Twitter feed responded and said, well, you know, here's what I think, or uh, I'd like to give my input here. This is really exciting back here, and started kind of engaging with them. And so then they said, well, the question is about a costume. Let's ask the costume designer. So they found the costume designer's Twitter handle and tweeted her. She was in California working on another project, and she stopped and said, well, interesting that you should ask. Here's what I was thinking of, and this was my inspiration for that piece. So it was so fascinating to see that kind of community come together that way. I realized, and we could talk for five days about some of the artistic implications there and what your artistic and production teams might say about that, um, but for people who were willing to engage, it was magical. Um, we've created, to your board point, uh, I do a presentation with our board called Tweet If You're Bored, um, and they learn about Twitter, and I ask them, the board challenge every year is everybody get on Twitter. Um, so they, those of, some of them won't do it. You know, it's not for them. But if we can get them just seeing what the platform is, what it's about, and why it matters, why people use it, um, even if they don't engage, it still goes a long way towards saying, this is of value to some of our audience members, and it's just worth experimenting with. How are we doing? Good. Oh, good. Well, we sent out a subscriber survey to say what happened, why, why have you fallen off, um, and asked them to be really honest about it. Um, and what we found is, and I really need to dig into this data further because I find it shocking, what we found is that they aren't coming back at all. They didn't fall off and become radical hospitality users, they're just no longer attendees. Um, so uh, that could mean a lot of things. Some of them said, uh, I don't want to sit next to the people I'm sitting next to anymore. Um, and that's one thing, um, but some of them had all kinds of things. You know, the programming changed and I don't like it, or you know, we didn't have time. Uh, so I look forward to two seasons, two full seasons of information where I can really dig in and see, okay, who did we really lose? Uh, and, and go back to them and ask for more feedback about it. Um, I also think that next season we'll have a much better sense of who were ticket buyers last season who are now radical hospitality users and vice versa. You know, what is kind of that exchange too? Yeah. Did oh. the programming change? 
No, it didn't. I mean, we do every season is different programming, but so it didn't change right at the same time as the no, the it didn't. Mm -mm. And in fact, we use a, you know our artists. We don't have an ensemble theater company, but many of our artists are repeat artists at Mixed Blood. It's a small community, and they work at you know many of the same theaters. So you will even see many of our same artists on stage. Yeah. The latter. Did you all hear that question? Are we supposed to do this? Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Do they need to use the microphone? No. Oh, okay. Oh, I tricked you up. Oh, we're out of time? Oh, um, no, they fell off entirely. It diminished. So, um, you know, I. We are at the same amount. Okay. Yep. But they did. But we did lose subscribers. So. But your actual bottom line of earned income is the same. It's uh, yep. It almost completely evened out. Okay. Can we take one more? Okay. I'm just so curious about how your artists are um, reacting to the changes in your audience beyond just the tweeters. So if you're radically looking at, we're not going to push our own. <laughs> how are the artists dealing with it, or how do they react and embrace that policy as well? The artists are incredible. I mean, the artists are, they are flexible. They are designed to be. I mean, they are just one of the, you know, in the process. I can't speak to the artistic process because I'm not in the rehearsal room with them every day. But I do know that when they come into the space, they're given a very solid orientation about what mixed blood is about. Um, and m much of them, I mean, many of the artists who come in and work with us, uh, have worked with us, like I said, in the past, or have a real commitment to the mission. So they're easy sells. I mean, I really, artists' salaries have not dropped as a result of radical hospitality. Mixed Blood is committed to protecting its artists uh, and paying them uh, as well as we possibly can. So um, they've been, I think that our artists would say, and again, I hesitate to speak for them, but I feel that they would say they're on board with it. I mean, they've, they've certainly projected that to us and been really generous. I'm at Amanda at mixedblood.com. Uh, if you'd like to continue this discussion or just want some information from me, I'm happy to send you some of the materials we talked about. But I thank you for your time. Um, and you know, I hope we can keep talking.